on this edition of It's a Miracle. A hate crime during the Hanukkah and Christmas holidays galvanizes a community. I can't imagine anybody not wanting to do something, and it wasn't just the holidays. It's just someone in my neighborhood had been hurt deeply, and they were hurt because they were Jewish, and I was not gonna stand for it in my neighborhood. Discover the miraculous way a neighborhood fights back. And a strange force leads a man to a fishing pier in the middle of the night and places him in exactly the right spot for a miracle. And a story that proves that being in the right place at the right time can have miraculous results. Then, they were high school sweethearts who went their separate ways, but years later they would be brought back together by a dream, a magical second chance at love. These stories and more on It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle, happening to everyday people, changing their lives forever. It's a miracle. Good evening, and welcome to a special edition of It's a Miracle. I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Mia Peoples. As we begin this holiday season, the importance of miracles in our lives becomes very evident. Regardless of your race or religion, miracles are a part of all of our histories and are included in all of our holiday celebrations. Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, and the lighting of the menorah is a centuries-old tradition which commemorates a miracle in Jewish history. 2,200 years ago, after winning their rebellion against Greece and reclaiming the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, a single night's supply of consecrated oil was able to keep the temple's lamps burning for eight days until more oil was found. It also symbolizes the religious freedom won during that war. And in our first story, the menorah becomes a modern day symbol for the incredible power that can exist when people band together against hate and intolerance. The Kushnik family are Russian immigrants who left their homeland to escape persecution. As Jews in communist Russia, they were not allowed to openly celebrate religious holidays. But here in America, they finally felt safe to honor their centuries old traditions. And each year, to celebrate their religious freedom, the Kushniks proudly display an electric menorah in their window. But this year, their window menorah would take on a new meaning, one of religious persecution rather than religious freedom. At approximately 4.30 a.m., a car with three teenage males approached the Kushnik home and stopped. They had targeted the house, the only one on the block displaying a menorah, for a hate crime. The Kushniks were awakened by the terrifying sound of glass breaking. No, I'm not going to stay. It became immediately clear that someone had attacked them because of their religion. It brought back horrible memories from their past. Their rabbi, Elliot Strom, explains. Living in what was then the Soviet Union as a Jew was a, a frightening phenomenon. And to have this rear its ugly head uh, at a moment where they felt, I'm sure, completely secure and without, without anxiety, I can only imagine the kind of terror that they felt and the feeling that you get when you think you're finally safe and then you wonder whether you really are. The next morning, while police investigated the incident, News of the hate crime spread throughout the neighborhood. Margie Alexander lived only a few doors away from the Kushniks, but felt compelled to offer her assistance, even though she barely knew the victims. Yes? Hi, uh, Margie Alexander. I heard what happened. If there's anything that I can do, please let me know. Thank you. But what could she possibly do to make her neighbors feel safe again? And I went back home and I thought about it and thought about it and eventually I came up with the idea of everybody having an electric manure. It seems like a simple solution, you know, but if everybody had one, everybody would be equal. And so Margie began a search for electric menorahs. 
to have everyone on the street by sundown with the menorah in their window was a goal that I wasn't sure was going to be obtainable when I started out. Trying to get a lot of electric menorahs on the third day of Hanukkah was a challenge. And it got further away as I was going from one store to the next door to the next door. And as I got around to maybe the third, maybe the fourth store, I was starting to say, you know, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. I'm gonna give out. And it was just around then that I got a telephone call on my cell phone. And it was my other neighbor. <laughs> Lisa. And she's already got a few of them also. Okay, I've got seven. Uh -huh. In an amazing coincidence, her neighbor had come up with the exact same idea. And so now, Margie joined forces with Lisa Keeling. Okay, I'm gonna find out how many are in this store. Okay, I'll call you right back. I can't imagine anybody not wanting to do something. And it wasn't just the holidays. It's just someone in my neighborhood had been hurt deeply. And they were hurt because they were Jewish. And I was not going to stand for it in my neighborhood. Hello, Margie? <sighs> yes, OK, I have seven. How many do you have? And I was just completely supported by somebody else saying, hey, you know what? This is the right idea. Let's do this. And it, and it was enough to keep going. OK, I'll go over here. The two women were able to find a total of 18 menorahs that day, one for every house on the block. The next step was to rally their neighbors to take part in their plan. Hit me like a lead balloon that suddenly I'm going to be asking people to put menorahs up in their window. And I have no idea if they're going to say yes, if they're going to say no. Are your mom and dad home? If this is going to go over well or, or, or completely bomb, I have no idea. And we stressed that you were essentially putting yourself as a target because we didn't know who had committed this crime. This is an electric menorah. What happens is... And we explained what Hanukkah is all about. We explained to them how you light a menorah, and we told them what happened to a neighbor. Many of the people that we talked to didn't really know who they were, or they, it didn't matter to them. And uh, they said that this is no problem. They would definitely support someone in our neighborhood and make them feel safe. The Kushnick family had no idea what their neighbors were doing on their behalf. And so when Mrs. Kushnick drove home that night, she was greeted by a sight she will never forget. Every neighbor on the block had placed a menorah in their window in a shining display of solidarity and support. And I think she was quite overwhelmed because after having something so horrible happen to you, to have them stand up beside you, just really overwhelmed her. To me, it was a beautiful sight. There were Christmas decorations lit, and there were Hanukkah decorations lit, and everything was the way it was supposed to be. There's a wonderful story that comes out of the uh, Nazi conquest of, uh, of uh, Denmark in the Second World War. They insisted that the Jews wear identifying armbands or stars that had uh, Yuda in the middle, that means Jew. The Danish king said, we are all Danes. If this is what you're going to insist on, we're all Jews. And the story is that he himself wore the Jewish star and asked all of his, his fellow citizens to do so. And I thought of that story when I thought of what it must have been for this woman to drive along her street and to see that she was no longer going to be singled out in this terrible way by what these kids had done. In the Soviet Union, it was unthinkable for there to be that kind of support from the community. And here she gets it in such a dramatic fashion. That night, the incredible support of their neighbors gave the Kushniks the courage to place their menorah once again in their window. I've been told, and I believe, that you can't save the whole world. You can only save a little piece of it. And if this is my piece of it to save, then, then that's what I'm going to do. Thank you so As a token much of their appreciation, Lisa and Margie's neighbors gave them a special gift along with everyone else on the street, a beautiful Christmas ornament. It's very nice to me that someone who is Jewish and does not follow my religion can give me not only an ornament for my holiday, but a church. When we put up our tree, we always put 
our, our special little church at a spot that's very prominent on the front. And both Lisa and Margie continue another holiday tradition. I will always display a menorah in my home so that people who come to my house will know that they're welcome here, their beliefs are welcome here, and that the, the light will shine around me. I have personally made the decision to continue to put out my menorah along with the rest of my Christmas decorations because it reminds me personally of how doing something good, even if it is just a small thing, could make such a wonderful impact on so many different people's lives. I suspect that those people who question whether there are miracles in the world today are looking for something um, supernatural and dramatic. I think if you're looking for those kinds of miracles, you might look for a long time and be disappointed. But the real miracles are acts of kindness that people perform for each other. When there's no ulterior motive and there's no personal gain, to me, that's the greatest miracle of all. The teenagers responsible for the attack on the Kushnik family were eventually arrested and charged with several offenses, including ethnic intimidation. As part of their sentence, they were required to write an essay on the effects of anti-Semitism as well as an apology to the family they terrorized. We'll be right back. In the spirit of this holiday season, I want to share a story with you about a true selfless act of giving from one human being to another. It's about a miraculous chance encounter that would change two men's lives forever. And I think it's proof that if you follow your heart and expect nothing in return, giving can be one of life's greatest blessings. The Hermosa Beach Pier is a landmark that draws fishermen and tourists from all over Southern California. In the summer of 1990, the pull of the pier would bring together two men whose powerful friendship would result in a miracle that would save a life. At that time, Los Angeles area resident Rick Wilson was having the most mysterious experience of his life, an inexplicable insomnia that allowed him little more than an hour of sleep a night. After suffering many sleepless nights, he found himself being drawn at all hours to the Hermosa Beach Pier. It was as if some unknown force was luring him there. It got to the point where I was so frustrated, I would walk out onto the end of the pier where there was nobody standing, and I would just look up in the sky and yell to the top of my lungs, why am I here? Frank Rembert also spent a lot of time at the pier that summer, but for a different reason. At 53 years of age, he hardly thought he would be at the end of his life, but his kidneys were failing. Dialysis treatments were becoming more painful and less effective. If a kidney donor didn't arrive soon, he would die. My chances were very slim, and I had kind of put it in my mind that I wasn't going to make it. One afternoon on the pier, Frank had an accident. He snagged his finger on a fish hook, causing a bloody wound. Out of nowhere, a stranger appeared and asked Frank if he needed a bandage. That stranger was Rick Wilson. So I helped him put the bandaid on, and uh, when I did that, I just, it was, it was uh, like the feeling like I had to be at the pier was just like gone. And that just told me right there, this is, this is why I'm here. The two men talked for hours and agreed to meet again. Two days later, Rick found Frank fishing in his usual spot. This time, Frank had just come from dialysis and wasn't feeling well. He actually looked like he was dying, and we started talking uh, about what was wrong with him. Rick found out that without a kidney donation, Frank would die. Within days, he met secretly with Frank's doctor. We have him on three different lists. 
for. And they were kidding. That's when he told me that it would be like five, five to ten years before he got a kidney, you know, if he lived that long. Almost as an afterthought, Rick asked the doctor if he could take tests to determine if he might be a suitable donor himself. And he says, well, chances are it won't match because he's black and you're white. And uh, I said, well, is it, can we take a shot at it? You know, if it's a million to one chance, there's that one chance that it might happen. Blood and tissue tests would reveal that Rick and Frank were a perfect match. Immediately, Rick approached Frank with what he'd learned. And I said, you know what? We match close as brothers. And I said, what? You're going to get a kid? He said, yep, we match just like brothers. You cannot just give your kidney to a complete stranger. Rick's determination to give Frank a kidney was threatening to tear his family apart. What about the girls? My wife, it got down to the point where, where we would argue all the time. She didn't want me to do it because it was a a uh, potentially fatal surgery, she says, well, why don't you save your, your kidneys for your kids, you know? And I said, well, this is something I've got to do. Then an incredible coincidence occurred that caused Rick's wife to change her mind. She pulled up to a stop sign about two blocks away from home, and she saw a bumper sticker on the car in front of her that said, uh, kidney donors save lives. Ever since then, she's been 100% behind me. Eight months after Rick and Frank met, they went into surgery. The transplant turned out to be a complete success. They not only gave him my kidney, they had to actually pump two pints of blood into him, of my blood, to get him his genes ready for my organ. So actually, we're closer than brothers. Today, seven years after the operation, Rick and Frank are still close as family. The mysterious pull that brought Rick to the pier resulted miraculously in the saving of a life and the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Now that I look back on the whole thing, I think uh, actually God was drawing me to the pier. He wanted me to be there to meet Frank and uh, save this man's life. I just believe in God. Every day I thank, give him thanks that he sent Rick to me to give me life. I do believe in miracles now, because they do happen. And uh, Frank walking around right now is, uh, is proof of that. Stay with us for more incredible stories when It's a Miracle returns. When you see an ambulance, romance is probably not the first word that comes to your mind. You may think accident, emergency, hospital, and all those things play a part in our next story. But the miracle is that because of this accident, this emergency, and this hospital, two people found romance. On the night of August 7, 1987, Gary Hyder of Houston, Texas, had a dream he would never forget. I fell asleep on the couch. I saw an accident. This was no mere dream. The accident would one day actually occur, and miraculously, it would lead Gary Hyder to be reunited with the love of his life. I'm Joanne, I'm Don's daughter. <laughs> I know, I'm Gary. I In 1980, you. Gary first met a young woman named Joanne Nelson Joanne. at a party at her father's home. I had a really good time. Soon the couple became inseparable, but Gary's lack of direction for his life eventually caused Joanne to end their relationship. I don't think it's a good idea anymore. What? You and me. We were very much in love, and um, what made us break up was just the fact that I wanted to go to college. And at the time, Gary didn't have any plans for his future. She broke my heart, and uh, I went over to the house in the afternoons to even try to talk to her, and she just, she basically, she blew me off. In spite of Joanne's reservations, Gary went on to become a successful businessman. But as the years passed, he never forgot Joanne. I really never saw her much, but I always knew where she was, what she was doing. 
I have saw other girls at that time, off and on. I just really was ne really never interested in anybody else. Joanne went on to marry another man and have a child, but then she divorced. Seeking a new life, Joanne joined the Air Force. Shortly after basic training ended, Joanne and some friends headed to the Rocky Mountains for a camping trip. The night before, Gary had had his dream. I went into a, not a deep sleep, and I, and I had this vision. I saw this car. There was people in it. And it just busted into flames. Gary did not have a clear vision of who was involved in the accident. Nevertheless, he felt moved to say a prayer for their safety. And I said, okay, Lord, please save the people that's in, the, in this accident. So I, I, I prayed, and so therefore, I, I didn't think anything of it, because I might have known them, and I might not have. The very next day, Gary's dream proved to be a horrifying reality. One of the people in the car was Joanne. I was tired, I had kind of dozed off, and I awoke to the accident beginning. And I realized that we weren't going to stop. And then we started spinning and rolling. I'm not sure if it was in my mind or out loud. I just called out to God to please save me. We did land uh, upright, but your first thought is to get out of the car. I did try to get out of the car, but the door was jammed, and so I couldn't get out of the car. I had also broken my, my right wrist, which would have been the hand I was using to get out of the car, so, so I really wasn't in any shape to move anywhere. As the car tumbled, Joanne's neck was broken. At the hospital, doctors discovered that two vertebrae were fractured an injury which usually results in paralysis or death. Gary learned of the accident from Joanne's father. Uh, I go to her dad's station on Monday to gas up, and I say, hey, how's Joanne doing? He said, well, she was in an accident over the weekend. She broke her neck, and she's in the hospital. Are you thirsty? Mm -hmm. Want a drink? Gary made the startling connection between his dream there and the go. accident. He called Joanne at the hospital, and soon became a constant presence at the bedside of the girl he had never forgotten. I just started praying. I said, thank you, God, for saving her. And at that particular time, nobody really knew that what her status was, I guess, uh, if she was going to be paralyzed or, or what the case might be. As time passed and Joanne's condition improved, Gary shared his dream with Joanne. I said, you're not going to believe this, but I prayed for you in that accident. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I had a vision on Friday night before the accident that somebody was in that accident that I knew. And, you know, I'm looking at you. You were, you were the person. What's also amazing is that the date of my accident, which was August the 8th, is actually the first day that Gary and I started dating years earlier, seven years earlier. I announce to you a new family. Mr. and Mrs. Hyde. Two months after the accident, Gary proposed marriage and Joanne accepted. They both agreed that Joanne's tragic experience, when combined with Gary's dream, was a miracle in disguise. It's a miracle from God that, uh, that I had the vision to begin with, and therefore to respond, to pray for those people in that accident to save their life. I feel amazed because it brought us back together. Uh, I, I got my second chance to marry the lady that I love. It was no coincidence that Gary and I uh, were, were put back together, that we met again, that we started dating. I'm here now with Gary. We've been married for 10 years. Gary and I were definitely destined to be together. God does miracles. He's alive, and uh, he, he does them every day. Welcome back to It's a Miracle. 
Have you or someone you know ever gone through a truly life-threatening experience? Well, in our next story, a man discovers what it's like to be in a desperate situation where your life hangs in the balance and the only thing that can save you is a miracle. On the afternoon of October 15, 1993, John Willison climbed aboard his single-engine plane for a routine flight. He didn't know it at the time, but his life was about to change dramatically. An experienced pilot, John had logged hundreds of hours of flight time. Today, he would be towing an advertising banner behind his plane. But when he flew the plane low enough to pick it up, he missed. Before he made a second pass, John banked the plane sharply to check that the cable wasn't tangled. By looking at the hook, I wasn't looking at what I was doing, and I'd pulled the stick back a little bit, and the nose kept climbing. The plane went into an accelerated stall. One look at the altimeter, and John knew that he was seconds away from plummeting to Earth. I knew if I had a stall, uh, things were going to happen awful fast. He quickly tightened his shoulder harness, and that's when he experienced a series of events he will never forget. All of a sudden, I heard in my headset, John, everything's going to be all right. And just a tremendous peace came over me. As I was headed toward the ground, all of a sudden, I see two people standing on the ground. And I thought, I don't want to hit anybody. And how did they get out here uh, over on the east side of the airport on the grass? I thought they were people. And then just before I hit the ground, I mean, I hit right where they were standing, I realized that was celestial beings. That, that's when I realized that, that there was uh, a presence there to uh, catch my fall. And, and I mean, I actually hit the ground totally at peace. Eyewitnesses estimate that the plane crashed at more than 70 miles per hour. The impact ruptured the main fuel tank and the aircraft immediately burst into flames. And then John saw a vision, what he can now only describe as an angel. And I remember looking up and going all the way up and going, wow. And he had on a tunic looking outfit and had long blonde hair. I couldn't see his face but it was an angelic being standing there. And I remember thinking, why is this fire not touching me? And then all of a sudden, smoke started coming inside the cockpit and started filling up the cockpit where I couldn't hardly see. I look over here and I see a face. He started breathing on me, just breathing. And I remember leaning forward to breathe his breath uh, because I would think, why am I not choking? This is pretty strong smoke in here. Jerry McAdams was the first person to reach the crash site. I could see John. There was, there was smoke inside there where he was. He was in a totally enclosed environment. And I don't really see how he remained conscious, to be honest with you. He just reached up one time and just hit his hand like that and it hit the latch perfectly, knocked it open, didn't even look at it. And so I was able to pull the latch open. And I remember th thinking, boy, this is hot. We're talking seconds from the time they rolled me out of the airplane and we got away from that plane. All of a sudden, that plane blew up. And I mean, it was, it was a towering inferno. And I remember stopping and looking at that and thinking, I am alive. I remember sitting there on the ground thinking, I was just seated right there where all that fire is. And I'm alive. Within minutes, John was airlifted to the Harris Methodist Fort Worth Hospital. His attending physician was Dr. Raymond Ferris. The fact that, that he was able to survive the, the, the G-forces of this crash and, and in this cockpit and protect it and get out in time before the fire started, that really is uh, remarkable. John's injuries were confined to his face. Amazingly, for as long as he had remained inside the burning plane, tests revealed that there was no smoke in his lungs or blood. Well, I think the, the, the faith that John had and the experience that he had before, during, and after the accident made his attitude such a positive attitude that uh, there's just no way to keep him down from that. Things like this really do confirm your faith. 
when you see stuff like that happen. You realize that, you know, there is a God out there and he's watching over us. And things like this are proof to me. Do you believe in fate? That certain events are meant to happen? That even if the odds are a billion to one, they'll still occur? Well, if you don't believe in fate, after this next story, you will. Patrick Godfrey's life has truly been blessed. At 55 years of age, he has everything he ever dreamed of having. And with a loving and devoted wife at his side, his life is happy and complete. I just love you. Most of all. I have a wonderful life. I have become the person I always wanted to become. But things were not always like this for Patrick. In the late 1970s, at age 35, he saw a stormy marriage end in divorce. He became an alcoholic and nearly died from withdrawals. I was in pretty bad shape. Alcoholism runs in my family, and I had become a victim of that disease. I was definitely in the dumps and didn't have any idea what was what the future looked like. Patrick was physically, emotionally, and financially bankrupt. With no place to turn, he moved in with his mother. One evening, I was sitting around with my mom going through old family photos and came across a picture of me and my childhood sweetheart, Marjorie Southworth. Marjorie and I met in the seventh grade, and we dated off and on throughout high school. And I was always very, very attracted to her. She was always the date for me. I just didn't know when I was 19 or 20 years old uh, and feeling so strongly toward Marjorie, I just, it just never occurred to me to ask her to marry me. I was overwhelmed with this feeling. Why couldn't I have married Marjorie in the first place? She was the only woman that I've ever loved. Patrick felt a strong need to find Marjorie. He called every Southworth in the Los Angeles telephone directory, but none of the listings belonged to Marjorie. Then the very next day, Patrick chose a different route to work, and miraculously, his high school sweetheart came back into his life. We were at the uh, metered on-ramp, and I looked over to my right, and I said to myself, I said, you know, that looks like Pat Godfrey. <laughs> I honked the horn and I took my glasses off and he looked over at me and he saw it was me. I was in total shock. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was just totally blown away by this experience. And I remember starting to cry and, and then I started to laugh at uh, my, my good fortune. I've never heard anybody figure the odds, but it had to be millions to one when you figure all the people on the freeway going to work. And uh, I think it was sort of meant to be. Patrick and Marjorie spent the next six months getting to know each other all over again. Then, hoping to correct a mistake he had made years before, Patrick asked for Marjorie's hand in marriage. I told her that I wanted to spend my life with her. And she said, what are you trying to say? And I said, I'm trying to say, will you marry me? And she said, uh, she was. Today, Patrick and Marjorie have been married for 19 years and are still madly in love. I love Marjorie very much. I do believe this is a miracle. And I believe it's a, it's a special gift. There's no, there's no explaining it. Pat's and my getting back together I feel was divinely influenced and most certainly a, a very special gift. I believe that it was put together by a higher power. In my heart, I know that's true. At this time of year, angels seem to turn up everywhere. They're constant reminders of the miracles of this holiday season. But angels can appear whenever and wherever they're needed, and our next story proves it. 
On October 24, 1997, college junior Brett Odom, his girlfriend Mary Wallace, and his cat Jasmine set off for a camping trip in the Smoky Mountains. We had had a very busy week and we had planned a sort of a vacation. We were meeting my parents and some of our church friends at a campsite. We were just really excited. Um, just and we were talking about the whole weekend and you know what I, what I could look forward to and campfires and singing songs. As we got closer, we realized that there was a shorter way to go, and so doing? we took that road because of the map. I was following pretty close behind a white minivan. Brett continued to follow the van's lights along the narrow, twisting road. I turned around to see how the cat was doing in the back seat. When I turned back around, I saw the taillights of a minivan disappear around a curve. But there wasn't time for Brett to make the turn himself, and his truck plunged over the embankment into a creek below. At the same moment, miles away at their campsite, Brett's mother, Janice, was experiencing a bizarre physical reaction. I began to feel this heat sensation, and it was very strange. And when I looked down, my right hand was a sky blue. And I thought, I'm having a heart attack. But as quickly as the sensations began, they disappeared. The experience left Janice with the need to cling to her younger son, as if he might be all that she had left. Her husband, Dr. Alan Odom, sensed that something was wrong. What's the matter? I don't know. I think we better go look for Brett and Mary. Janice had a very uneasy feeling. Uh, in that uh, and she's a very discerning individual and she thought that we ought to go look for Brett since he was late. Janice Odom's premonition could not have been more accurate. Even now, her son's truck lay partially underwater at the bottom of a steep ravine. Mary was still alive, but terrified. As I was panicking and thinking that I was going to die, I heard a voice and I saw a man standing next to me. And he said, you're not going to die right now. Someone needs your help. That is when I suddenly became aware of the fact that Brett was underwater. Once she realized that I was underwater and couldn't do anything, she would pick me back up and, and try and keep my head lifted up on her knees up out of the water so that I could breathe. Oh my god, don't leave me now. Miraculously, the driver of the white minivan had seen the accident and immediately flagged down an approaching vehicle driven by an off-duty park ranger. By the time Brett's parents arrived on the scene, the rescue was well underway. There was a lot of activity. We saw the blue lights flashing. I said, well, someone's had a wreck or something. The Odoms soon learned that Mary and Brett had been pulled from the car and airlifted to a hospital near Knoxville, Tennessee. She said the boy's broken his neck, and the girl has a lot of injuries. The Odoms rushed to meet their son at the hospital. It was a moment that Dr. Odom will never forget. The feelings that I have as a physician were one of concern for the, for the patient that has a broken neck and broken back. The feelings that I have as a parent, as a father, were indescribable. Dr. Odom knew that his son needed a specialist, and so he contacted a friend, Dr. Scott Hodges, at a conference in New York. Brent's been in a terrible accident. I could detect the uh, stress in his voice, and I felt that I really needed to come home and at least be with him. He had a dismal prognosis for being able to ever walk again. The general consensus would have been that he was paralyzed and would remain that way for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, Dr. Hodges agreed to operate. Procedure involved a rather large incision through the chest. We uh, took away all of that bone that was compressing his spinal cord. Next, a bone taken from a cadaver was grafted onto Brett's damaged spinal column to hold it in place. Knowing the surgery might not be a success, the Odoms decided it was time to ask for a miracle. We're trying to get a hold of, of some oh, people thanks. and we want to start Thank the you preaching very much. Out. We have had people literally praying for us all over the world. This person would tell that person, that person would tell this person. And um, you'll hear my husband tell you that he felt like it was like a steam locomotive. And the locomotive picked up speed and it just kept going and kept going and kept going and just charged right by us. 
After the long hours of surgery, Janice and Alan finally got to see their son. How you feeling, honey? I felt better. What's the matter? My skin kind of hurts. You can feel her touch you? Uh-huh. Can you feel this? Uh-huh. He had sensation in his hands and his arms and his feet. So there was potential there. The fact that he did have a broken neck and broken back, though, is a very serious, that's a very serious injury. Weeks after recovering from her own injuries, Mary was able to visit Brett. It was a very emotional moment. I was really afraid that he was going to reject me because of the way I looked. He just gave me the biggest grin, and I felt some of the nervousness just kind of melt away. I climbed up on his bed and I laid next to him and it was just, it was really hard to do because neither one of us knew what kind of future he faced. I was afraid that if he was going to be paralyzed, that he was going to be angry at me for saving him when perhaps he would have rather died. At that point in time, there was, there was no thought to anything beyond the present situation. It was a massive effort to make it minute to minute. Over the next two months, Brett worked constantly in physical therapy to try to reclaim some of his motor skills. I went from just being able to flinch muscles at first to actually being able to lift my arm to being able to sit up in a chair. Once we got to that point, my Recovery was moving very, very rapidly, and I was convinced that if there was a miracle to be had, and if it was God's will, I was going to walk out of the hospital. And 63 days later, Brett's miracle became a reality. God showed us very small miracles each day, which added into the one big miracle that Brett was able to walk out of the spinal cord unit. The dramatic events surrounding Brett Odom's near-fatal accident contain all the elements of a miracle. From his mother's premonition that her son had been injured to the strange voice that told his girlfriend she had lived to save his life, the mysteries of that night point to a higher power watching over Brett Odom's life. I think one of the greatest things about this accident, if, if there can be anything great that comes out of it, it is the opportunity to uh, share with other people just um, how great God really is. God has made it very clear to me that bad things do happen to good people, and that doesn't mean that God's an ogre and inflicts pain on people. It means that it's part of His greater plan, and that if we can keep our eyes on Him, we'll stay in His hand, and He will direct our paths. Changing their lives forever, it's a miracle. That's our show for tonight. We hope you enjoyed this special holiday edition. It's the season for miracles, and we'll be bringing you many more in the weeks to come. I hope you'll join us next time. Until then, happy holidays. Good night.